Welcome to Celebration. Thank you for joining us as we look into God's Word again. Uh, I just want to say that for those of you that have been with us all year long, uh, that means 2020 and now into 2021, uh, it's just a blessing to get to share God's Word with you. If you're new to us, go back and look at some of the other messages, in particular these last few weeks because we're in a series. A series of Easter questions, I'm calling it, because the questions are found in the gospel passages that relate to the Passion Week of Christ, His final few days that lead up to Easter. And of course, that's where we're at on the calendar. Easter is next Sunday. And so uh, we want to look at some questions and take them very seriously. And today we're going to look into Matthew chapter 27, verses 20 to 22. And our question comes from Pilate, who said, what should I do with Jesus? But let me just set the stage for you for a moment here. And that is that uh, Jesus had surrendered himself to the mob in, in that night. And they took him to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And they had a mock trial and some false witnesses. You probably know this, but uh, they were determined to find him guilty of blasphemy and, and have him killed. Now, the Jews didn't have the power because they were under Rome's rule uh, to execute someone. And so they needed the Romans involved in this. So they took him to Pilate. Uh, Pilate had some concerns and uh, voiced those, and they kind of wrestled back and forth. Uh, but they had a tradition under Roman rule, that during this Passover feast, uh, the Romans would release one prisoner, wh whomever they wanted released. And so that comes into play here as he uh, challenges them to let Jesus go, uh, as opposed to one of their insurrectionists that had been arrested, and that was Barabbas. Uh, Pilate just really didn't want to do this, it seems like. Uh, and yet he gave in to pressure. So that's the scene. They've brought Jesus then to Pilate, trying to get him to crucify him. He's trying to decide what to do with Jesus. We'll see that question come up in our scriptures. So Matthew 27, beginning with verse 20. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two men do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? And that's the question you and I need to ask. What should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Well, they all answered him, crucify him. Well, what did Pilate do with Jesus? Um, he tried several things. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the crowd and, and Pilate and, and the people of that day. But the more important thing, of course, is the people of today. So what did Pilate do? Well, he tried to pass him off to King Herod and make it a Jewish thing, but that didn't work. Uh, he tried to just ignore the whole thing. In fact, his wife had a bad dream and said, uh, don't have anything to do with this man. This is trouble. And so he tried to get out of it. You may remember that he washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I wash my hands of this. That's where we get that saying. And uh, that didn't work either. They pressed him for it. Uh, so he tried to turn him loose. He tried to whip him and say, that's good enough. Now he can go free. And now uh, they demanded that he be crucified. So eventually what he did was make the order to crucify him. What did the crowd do, on the other hand, with Jesus? We see a lot of different reactions here. That's my point in bringing these up, that we see a lot of the same reactions today, in a sense. Uh, some of the crowd probably just ignored him and went on home. Some of the crowd stayed around for these uh, crucifixions. There were three there on crosses, and uh, um, they wanted to see it. You know, people are morbid. In the Old West, we used to hear about uh, drawing a crowd for a hanging day, and so uh, some came for the entertainment, and some came for the, uh, uh, the action of it, or just the crowd of it. Um, sure, there was some grief and mourning. His own mother was there, and a couple of followers, and uh, certainly they were saddened by the whole thing, but uh, the event went on, and, and it needed to because God had ordained that Jesus would die on the cross. But these people had to make up their own minds of what kind of response they would have with Jesus, What would they do with Jesus? And they made their decisions. The most important thing, though, is not what Pilate did, what the Romans did, what the Jews of the day did, what the crowd did, what the disciples did. What's important for me is, what do I do with Jesus? What's important for you is, what do you do with Jesus? Let me success, suggest some things that, uh, that go on today. We'll see some of that in the crowd. I think you'll recognize that. But... We see it today. Let me suggest three areas 
of responses to Jesus, uh, answers to this question. Uh, one is what most of the world does, and uh, it's not good. The second one sounds good on the surface, but it's really not the right thing either. And then the third one, of course, will be the right answer, but I think that maybe you might be a little surprised at, at it because it goes deeper than what the typical concept of Christianity might be. So what should we do with Jesus? Well, most of the world rejects him. That's not what we should do, but that's what most are doing. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, we already had a message uh, from the council who asked Jesus point blank, are you then the son of God? And so we dealt with the fact that most people in the world today say no. They reject him as being God in the flesh, as being the son of God, as being the savior, or even in the Jewish terms of being the Messiah. Most reject him. There's several different ways that uh, you might see that. Some just dismiss him altogether. They just ignore the fact that Jesus exists. Uh, they ignore the fact that he existed 2,000 years ago for a short time here on earth, let alone the fact that he's God and has always existed. Uh, many deny the history of it. They deny that the Gospels are true. You realize the Gospels were written shortly after they took place? There were people alive when the Gospels were written that were around Jesus' time. They could have easily refuted this if it wasn't history. They could have easy, easily said, these things aren't true. We were there. But that didn't happen because it's history. And yet, so much of the world just denies it. They deny the miracles. They deny the historicity of Jesus and, and these very events. And somehow in their mind, just, it's gone. It's just not real. It's just not true. But let me warn you if that's been your choice or you're thinking about, you know, that it's a fairy tale and we don't need to accept it. Jesus is real. He's alive. He's coming back. And the Bible tells us that one of these days, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you see, you can pretend to dismiss him. You can think you've dismissed him and his teachings and his miracles and the fact that he's the king of kings, but you can't dismiss him. He's real. You can't dismiss gravity and just step off of a tall building and think that's going to work out. Some things just are, and Jesus just is. So though they've tried to dismiss him and the world tries to dismiss him, it's really not going to work. Some take it a step further and actually deny him. Uh, they're, they're against him. And so they want to refute his teachings. They want to try to find ways to prove that he's not who he says he is. And, and they're more belligerent about it. Uh, some just ignore, but others are really, you know, working at it. Uh, they, they want the Bible destroyed. They want it out of there. Some deny that he's real, deny that he's God. Uh, but then there are others who really want to even destroy him. Uh, they want to destroy the Bible. They want to destroy its influence. Uh, they want to destroy Christianity. So they want to destroy our, the followers and our beliefs. Uh, so, so rejection comes in different forms. And so don't think just because you're not a destroyer that you haven't rejected him. Uh, it, it all leads to the same thing, and that is to a, just a total denial and rejection of the one that the Father sent to be the Savior of the world. To deny him, to try to destroy him, uh, is not going to work out for you. It's not working out right now for the world. Um, and so it's not really a good option. It wasn't a good option for those people. And it's even worse option now. But that's where the world sits. Go back and look at the message a couple of weeks ago when the question was, are you then the son of God? Uh, and see about the responses that people have. Most reject him. Some, on the other hand, respect him. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, they haven't necessarily become followers. Uh, they may not even call themselves Christians, or they might. Uh, but there's a certain amount of respect there. Uh, they call him good. Uh, they say he's the good teacher. And uh, that, that his words are good. And, and they'll quote him, and, and they'll use some scripture that, to go along with that. And, and so uh, you see that in the people of that day as well. Uh, they accepted his teaching and said, man, nobody's ever taught like this before. But they didn't follow him. Uh, they decided not to go with uh, his claims 
but just his teaching and that really kind of falls apart intellectually if he's a good teacher then his teachings must be true if he's not, not the son of god he would be a liar or maybe a lunatic that's not a good person, so uh, it doesn't really make a good argument. But nonetheless, there's a certain amount of respect there in the sense that he was a good teacher and he did some good deeds. Perhaps maybe somehow there were some miracles done. They're, they're giving him a little bit of credit. In fact, some even claim that he's godly. They, uh, they'll go a step further. Now, I didn't say that he's God. Uh, I believe that, and we'll get that in the third point, but... Some want to go with him being a godly person, you know, better than the average guy. That uh, obviously, if they had this trial, and they, you know, Pilate said, I can't find any fault in him. That's why he wanted to turn him loose. I can't find anything wrong here. Uh, so they're claiming that he's got some godly qualities, that he had good character, that his teachings were sound and, and uh, would elevate us if we could keep them so they're they're giving him a certain amount of respect they're giving him a certain amount of credit um, maybe you're one who you won't use his name in vain like much of the world does but at the same time you don't take his name as being a christian either uh, so so some reject him altogether and he's no more than a cuss word if he even exists uh, some give him a little bit of respect and and quote some of his bible and 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 like uh, parts of it, uh, even give him a not a godlike but a godly status, and so he's uh, among some of the best, and he's a great prophet, and and he uh, did a lot of good in the world, and so they give him a certain amount of respect, uh, but neither of those choices really work. You see, the problem is who he is. The problem is who he claimed to be and therefore verified with a resurrection from the dead. The problem is Jesus is not just some man. He's not somebody we can just deny. Somebody that we can just reject with no consequences. Oh, you can reject me. We can reject each other. We can reject a lot of philosophies. But if Jesus is the Son of God, how do you, re how do you reject God? You can claim to, and you can try to, and you can make it known that you don't believe you're an atheist or you believe in some other God, and therefore you reject him, but in the end, we all stand before him, and he has the last say-so. So it's not really a viable option, and yet most of the world rejects. Some that are a little bit closer to the truth recognize his goodness, recognize the benefits that he brought to mankind, give him a certain amount of respect, but in the end it's still saying he's not God, that he's not the answer, that he's not the one who gets us through this life into an eternity. Uh, respect doesn't do that. You have to surrender to him. And so respecting him doesn't go far enough. True respect will accept what he says and, and begin to follow. So reject him is not an answer, respect him is not a good answer, and yet that's pretty much most of the world until you get to Christianity. Now I'm talking about true Christianity. I'm talking about those who really accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that the Bible is true, and so what it says about him is true, and they have to confess our sins, and we have to give our lives to Jesus Christ, and then enter into a lifestyle that goes along with his word. Other people call themselves Christians just because they're not some of those other religions. And so they want to say, well, yeah, there's God and Jesus and the Bible and all that. And so I must be a Christian because I accept that. No, I'm going with the true definition. When you give your life to Jesus Christ. However, and here's what I said earlier that, that I think that possibly this third choice of what should I do with Jesus uh, might surprise you a little bit. You not only don't reject, you don't stop at just respect, but we have been called to reflect Him. We have call, been called to be like Him. It isn't just a question of, okay, I'm going to believe the information or I'm even going to kind of trust that He's true and right and get my ticket to heaven. 
and I'm just going to hang on till either Jesus comes back or I die. That's not Christianity. That's not what we've been called to do. You can search your Bible all you want, and you're not going to find that in there. That's not what it's about. It's about getting into, first of all, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, the entire New Testament is teaching us that because of what he did here, we were talking about him about to go to the cross in this passage that we read. When Jesus went to the cross, that was God himself offering himself as a sacrifice, as a perfect human, to pay for the sins of the world. That means my sin and your sin. The Bible teaches us, and it really doesn't take too much to realize we all sin and come short of the glory of God. And so that required a perfect human sacrifice, and God himself made that in Jesus Christ. When we put our trust in him, because three days later he rose from the dead to prove that he's God, and when we confess our sins and put our trust in him, the Father adopts us into his family, puts his Holy Spirit into us, and we now have a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship that has his spirit inside of me, which allows this process of reflecting him, bringing glory to him. The world needs to see Jesus in me. This isn't about just getting to go to heaven when I die. That is such a shallow interpretation of scripture. Uh, for so many people to call themselves Christian, and the only thing there is the fact that somewhere along the line they ask Jesus to save them, is so short of what the Bible teaches. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount that we should live a life of good works in response to his work on Calvary. And by doing these good works, the Father would get glory. People would look at my good works and your good works and see the Father because we're supposed to reflect him. The Apostle Paul taught us in Romans that uh, we are supposed to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That that's the whole point of God establishing the relationship is not just to get us to heaven, but to help us to be like Jesus. We're supposed to reflect him. He also told us in Philippians chapter 2 that we are to have the same mind and attitude of Christ Jesus who took on the form of man and then became a servant even to the point of sacrificing himself on the cross. And he said, you should have that same mind and attitude. We're supposed to reflect him. The Bible tells us that uh, that's the purpose. That's the purpose of, in us coming to that relationship. In Ephesians, Paul wrote to them at that church, even said we are to be imitators of God. The point is, when people look at the life of a Christian, that's where the name came from, is they said, that's another Christ. That's a little Christ. That's what the term meant, Christian. Today, we simply use it to mean that we have this Western world concept of religion versus the Eastern religions. That's not true at all. We have the name Christian because we've taken on the Spirit of Christ. And so we've been called to reflect Him not just accept him. There's a purpose to the accepting. I accept Christ in my life. I receive the Holy Spirit. And then I begin to live out that in this relationship. So when you're adopted into God's family, it's so that you might become more and more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's the proper response to what should I do with Jesus? I should reflect him. I should be in such a relationship, such a close relationship with him that he begins to live out of me. Most people won't really read their Bible, but they can read me and they can read you, and they will. They look at our lives because we profess to be Christians. They see that we go to church. They hear that we're different. They see that we're different. And they want to know, well, what is that difference? If that difference isn't a clear reflection of Jesus, then we're failing because all they see is somebody who's trying to be good, trying to be different. They need to see Jesus in us. And so reflecting Jesus, first of all, requires that relationship. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is, if you just have a religion, if you just have things that you're trying to do and trying to be good and trying to do right, that's not a relationship. Jesus talked about people who would come in the end times or at the end of their life, and he would reject them from heaven, and they'd say, but wait a minute, we did all these things in your name. And he said, but I never knew you. 
we don't have a relationship. You can't reflect Jesus without a relationship with Him. And so it starts there, but it doesn't end there because for me to really reflect Him, any of you that know me <laughs> know that's a, that's a stretch to say, well, I don't know, I don't see Jesus there. It requires reformation. I mean, that's the point. We were lost in sin. Our nature was pulling us away from God and, and causing us to do things for our own benefit, in our own way, for our own glory. But when we entered into a trust relationship with Jesus Christ, He comes into our life and begins to change us, transform us, reform us from the inside out. So Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And again, that one in Philippians chapter 2 where we're to, to take on the mind and attitude of Christ. I have to admit, and, and it's not that hard to admit, that I wasn't like him. None of us start out like Jesus. None of us will ever work enough to be good enough to be like Jesus. We can't do it because of that fallen nature in us. But when he puts his spirit into us, we have the potential, the ability, the power to allow Him to transform us as we read the Word of God, as we worship Him on a regular basis, as we spend time in prayer and around other Christians. The Spirit of God works inside of us. Paul wrote also that says that it is God in us both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. So that Spirit inside of us, along with the Word that we can read, reforms us, changes us, helps us to look and act and talk and be more like Jesus so that we have a more proper reflection of Him. And so to reflect Him requires, first of all, the relationship, then second of all, an ongoing process of reformation, and then it requires responses. It's not just about changing my feelings. It's not just about changing my mind. My actions come out of that. So as God changes me, as God changes you, as you cooperate with the work that He's doing inside of you, there has to be continual responses because we still are sinners. We still have our failings. We still have our weaknesses, our shortcomings. And as God's working on those, sometimes those come out <laughs> rather than the others. So it's a continual process. And as I respond, I get more like Jesus. As I do the things that he said. Jesus often talked about love, talked about obedience. Uh, he talked about actions. Love is an action word. Certainly obedience is an action word. To reflect Jesus Christ requires continual responses in obedience to the truth of God, to the truth of the Word. What should I do with Jesus? What should you do with Jesus? The answer to that really is that we've been called to reflect Him. You start with accepting Him as your Lord and Savior in your life. Get the relationship established. Begin to let Him work in you. But the whole point of that is that we would be like Christ. Pilate should have got it. The Jews for sure should have got it. What should I do with Jesus? He should have answered his own question. You know what I think I need to do with Him? I need to bow before Him. Surrender my life to Him. And let Him make a difference in it. Same answer 2,000 years later. What should you do with Jesus? You should receive Him as Lord and Savior. Lord means He's going to come into your life and change you. Savior, yeah, He saves you from your sins. You're going to get heaven out of it. But in the meantime, He's Lord. He's in charge. And He will change you to help you be more like Him, bring honor and glory to the Father, and be used for His purposes. That's the only real answer what to do with Jesus. Reflect Him. I'm going to pray for you and for myself. We've got a long way to go to be like Jesus, don't we? But we've got to try. Father, I thank you and praise you. You're an awesome God. You've put together this whole thing that we might have a relationship with you forever, not just in this short-term life. And so we thank you for that special blessing. But also thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God that together can help me as I cooperate with you to be more and more like Jesus. That when the world looks at me, they can see some things about Jesus and they can turn to you and say, you know what? I want Jesus. Help me to do the right thing with Jesus. That's reflecting. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.